Wednesday and half past the hour. Oh, hi guys. I'm just, you know, looking through my old yearbook. Most of my friends are dead. <sighs> I don't miss that guy, though. He was kind of a jerk. Don't be afraid, Dr. Tobor. I, Voltura, will show you how to dispose of this Captain video. Ah, birds, beautiful, plumed. Look at this fantastic specimen of society. Yes, dancing feathers. Lovely. Oh, dinosaurs! Nature's apex predator! Look at these two going at a Tyrannosaurus, but it's Tyrannosaurus over Triceratops! Ah, the graceful swan of the genus Cygnus. So elegant. Oh, Tyrannosaurus Rex! Apex predator! Terrifying, terrifying, terrible lizards! Dinosaurs! Yes, birds and dinosaurs. Two species related but separated by 65 million years of evolution. Now, if I know all of you, and I think I do, your question is probably how can something like this be related to something like this? Now, obviously, to answer this question fully, we have to go back a little bit to what we did before we had this little break, where we talked about how random mutations can cause a change in the physical appearance of a creature. Remember, evolution takes time, millions and millions and millions of years. So these gradual mutations that ultimately cause something like this to turn into something like this and develop feathers and different postures and different body parts took time. Remember, a disaster, an asteroid that hit the Earth, destroyed the dinosaurs and ultimately turned them into this thing. So, the mutations that birds have, feathers, the ability to fly, bones that are hollow and light that allow them to loft themselves through the air, evolved after the mass extinction that destroyed the dinosaurs because they were more advantageous to the environment that the dinosaurs found themselves in afterwards. Now, most modern birds evolved from the theropod dinosaurs. Those are dinosaurs like T-Rexes and Velociraptors, the one that stood on two legs and had their front arm shrink to this small diminutive size. But certain adaptations, especially the ones that we see in modern birds, which is their much smaller size, was an important adaptation for the time. For example, after the asteroid hit the Earth, a lot of the larger prey, like Triceratops or Brontosaurus, died off. And the smaller dinosaurs, the insectivorous dinosaurs, those are dinosaurs that were basically precursors of birds that ate insects, had a bit more of an advantage over the larger theropod dinosaurs, like Tyrannosaurus rex, that ate larger prey. Therefore, this was an adaptation. Again, insects at the time were also airborne. There was very, well, therefore, it was very easy for animals like the winged early bird Archaeopteryx to catch these insects on the wing. Now, all of this stuff is great, but it doesn't actually tell us how we should classify life. Now, the way that we actually do classify life, for example, finding the similarities between dinosaurs and birds, is something that we call taxonomy. Taxonomy started a while ago. Human beings have always wanted to categorize life into different pieces because it makes things a little bit easier. Finding the branches of the tree in life makes things more organized. This goes all the way back to men like Aristotle in the third century BC. But the most famous taxonomist has to be Carolus Linnaeus. Well, I've been a hunter all my life. I love animals. That's why I like to kill them. <laughs> Good day, Roy. 
Now, going back to the time of Aristotle, which is roughly 2,300 years ago, we see the very early stages of forming a coherent taxonomy. For example, Aristotle was one of the first to classify life forms, animalia specifically, into chordates and non-chordates or invertebrates. He was the first one to notice that certain animals had a spinal cord and some didn't. He was also one of the first to notice that with animals, certain ones laid eggs, which is what we call ovoviviparous, and certain ones gave birth to live young, which is what we call viviparous. That's like species like us, like mammals. Linnaeus, however, took it a few steps further. Aristotle wasn't consistent across the board with all of his classifications of life, even though we still use some of them. Linnaeus was one who categorized life into a kind of upside-down pyramid, with things being more general on the top and more specific towards the bottom. It's a success. The mosquito is dead. But Roy must make sure. There's nothing more dangerous than a wounded mosquito. The main event of the evening. Now your task for the day will be to use the classifications that Linnaeus have come up with and basically identify a series of monsters. Don't worry, I'll give you a little bit more explanation as we go forward. Plus, I've taken the liberty of narrating the slides, so be on the lookout for the little audio icon because this will greatly help you out with this assignment. Remember, this assignment is also due three days from now, so that'll be on Saturday evening. So keep your eyes posted for any things, any updates I might be sending on Remind, and also don't forget to turn in the work.